your back and we see all the seats are pretty full, only one or two escaped. So <laughs> it's great to have you all back. I want to especially uh, welcome Pastor Stan from Chinese Church up in Auckland. We're relating, connecting with. He was over there. I don't know where he is. There he is there with the same similar shirt to me. Let's give him a great welcome. It's great to have you with us. Fantastic. And uh, he and his wife served in our junior church ministry many years ago, went to Auckland, set up business, worked in children's ministry. Now they've planted a church reaching just all these young people. It's a fantastic church. So great to have you with us. I look forward to seeing your whole family tomorrow. <laughs> okay then, so in this session we're going to uh, start, uh, I'm going to do some teaching on discerning of spirits and uh, then we're going to do some activations for a little while just to get you busy. So we've probably got a little period of time while you've still got energy uh, after lunch and uh, after that we'll get you doing some activations. We've got, um, I'll try to keep the teaching sessions about 30 minutes time. So if you open up your notes there, you'll see the, uh, the section there on discerning of spirits. We all got it there? And uh, well, I'll, I'll just read to you a scripture passage, then we'll go into explaining it. And uh, this is uh, out of uh, book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 16. And uh, Paul, uh, Luke is writing, and he's writing about his adventures with Paul. And it came to pass when we went to prayer, a certain young woman who was possessed with a spirit of divination met us and brought her masters much gain by fortune telling. And the same followed Paul at us and cried out saying, These men are servants of the Most High God. They show us the way of salvation. And she did this many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And he came out that very hour. So, this is a, uh, uh, an interesting story in the New Testament of Paul is uh, going to a prayer meeting. And as he goes to a prayer meeting, uh, the place that they were in uh, was the center uh, of occult activities. It was a center of uh, spiritism, divination, that kind of thing. And so uh, what happens is there's a young woman there, and she, notice her message. Her message is, these are the servants of the Most High God. Is that correct? Yes, it was. They're showing us the way of salvation. Is that correct? Yes, it was. What she was saying was correct, but the motivating power behind it was a demonic spirit because she herself was involved in divination. It said there's a young woman who uh, was possessed with the spirit of divination met us. The word possessed is a very bad translation because it actually means literally to have a spirit, not uh, to be totally controlled. You use the word possessed, you think totally controlled. She's not totally controlled. She had a familiar spirit because she was involved in fortune telling. And it says she had a spirit of divination. The word divination is the word python. Literally, she had a python spirit wrapped around her, speaking into her ear, talking into her. It was invisible to the natural eye, but it was very real in the spirit world. So constantly, because of her involvement in divination, in the occult, she had the spirit familiar to her, attached to her, joined to her, would talk to her and give information about people. And so people would come, they'd pay money out to have their fortune told, and the spirit, because it had access to the spirit realm and spiritual network, spirit internet, uh, it could share facts about people that would stun them. And then as a result of that, they would open up their heart to receive direction, and their lives would come into agreement with the spirit and into bondage. Now, when you look at it, the woman is saying all the right things, but Paul discerns that behind it, there's a spirit operating. And he discerned exactly what it was. Luke said it's a spirit of a python, and it bought the masters, so she was a servant girl, a lot of money because of her fortune telling. So the whole of that area was given over to fortune telling, was given over to divination, given over to uh, 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 the demonic realm, and this girl came with a spirit. Now, Paul, it says an interesting thing. It said, Paul, but though she followed us and cried out, so and so, she did this many days. So Paul didn't address it immediately, but he became irritated by it. It says, Paul being grieved or feeling oppressed. Uh, I'll, the, the, exact meaning of that, uh, the exact meaning of that word I'll just get for you. Let me just uh, find it here. Uh, the exact word there means literally to toil or to struggle to break through or to uh, 
feel worried or pressured or to feel grief. Isn't that interesting? So when a spirit is operating against us, then you can feel all kinds of feelings or sensations like difficulty breaking through. There's no freedom or flow. Uh, you can feel a turmoil around you. You can feel uh, perhaps a stress trying to achieve what you're trying to achieve. Uh, or you may even feel grief. Those are the kinds of meanings associated with that word. And so he was experiencing the sensations. What she said was okay, but what was behind it at the root of it was demonic. And eventually, when the Holy Ghost led him, he turned around, spoke, and directly commanded the Spirit, come out of her, and immediately the woman, or over the next hour, she was delivered of that Spirit. And of course, if you read on, you find then that there was a massive reaction, and Paul was then put into jail and beaten up. And, uh, but there was, again, further miracles took place. So this is a region full of demonic activity, and this is the gift of discerning of spirits operating. He discerned or looked right through and found what was at the cause or what was the source of the problem. So uh, discerning of spirits, this is what it is. It is knowledge God gives you. So it's, it's a revelation God gives you. God reveals something to you. What does he reveal? He reveals what spirit is operating right behind some activity or action. So it's a supernatural gift of revelation. It means to see right through to what is the root or what is behind this matter. So the, the gift of discerning of spirits gives you information or insight or revelation about three areas. One, the activity of the Holy Spirit. We need to discern the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus consistently discerned what the Holy Spirit was doing and did it. So, so, so the one aspect of discerning of spirits is the realm of being able to see right through to what the Holy Spirit is doing. Another aspect of it is to be able to identify demonic activity. When there are spirits in a place, spirits in a person, or spirit behind someone's actions, we uh, need to be able to discern or see what is operating there. Otherwise, we come under the influence of it. Many times on some of the big moves of God, they lacked experience and discerning of spirits. And a lot of things they said with the Holy Spirit was actually demonic manifestations. I can remember being in a meeting one time, and uh, they were just saying, this is all just the Holy Spirit working and so on. And uh, I looked at the person that was next to me, or just in front of me, and I could see clearly there was a spirit operating. So I just quietly went up and just commanded the spirit to go. The person dropped to the ground. It was all over, and she was set free. I found it impossible to just focus while there's all this demonic stuff just going on around me. So that sort of dealt to that. So you have to understand this is not, one of the things it's not. It's not natural discernment. It's not working things out. You know, some people train in body language, so they can work out things from body language, look at the person, figure them out, you know. Uh, it's not natural. Uh, it's not uh, you've developed some skill at being able to work out some things going on in people. It's actually revelation that just comes to you. God just speaks and reveals it to you. And so that's how you know. So he can reveal the uh, activity or nature or name of, of spirits that are in a person. So to, this morning when I was praying, you notice I spoke against a spirit of infirmity. Now you notice that the moment I stood against that spirit of infirmity, there was quite a quick reaction or response. Uh, so that tells me that it was exactly what the problem was. There was a spirit was causing the pain in the person's body. For example, I had a, a young man, I was uh, speaking in City Harvest, and I had a, uh, a word of knowledge that was a, a young man with a shoulder condition, and uh, he had pain in his shoulder. So the young guy came up and as he began to speak to me, uh, interact with me, I felt the Lord say he, he has a major root of bitterness against his father. So I asked him, how do you get on with your father? He said, I love my dad. So it seemed like his initial response contradicted what God had shown me. So I said to him, well, uh, isn't it true that your father travels a lot and he's not there for you? And actually, you've got quite a lot of feelings about that. He said, that's right. I said, Lord shows me that you've been quite angry and actually become resentful and bitter that your dad has not been available for you when you've needed him. And he said, that's true. I said, well, the Lord showed me that the reason you have this pain in your shoulder, it's actually a spirit of infirmity, and it's come because of the unforgiveness in your heart towards your father. And you see, so some of that was word and knowledge, 
And some of that is discerning of spirits. The cause of the sickness is a demonic spirit. That's discerning of spirits. The nature of the problem, the issue with his father, that's word of knowledge. Okay? And so I asked him if he's willing to forgive his father, which he was. I led him in a simple prayer, forgave his father. As soon as I commanded the spirit to come out of him, it manifested quite strongly. He fell on the ground. He got up after that. And he then testified. He said, actually, I didn't just have pain in my shoulder. I had pain everywhere, all over my body. I've had this pain. The doctor has told me my back is stiffening. And by the age of 40, I would not be able to bend or move or twist at all. But he said, I now am completely free. So the spirit of infirmity had created pains in his body. And they were associated with an issue in his life of unforgiveness with someone. So, in this, so you see how gifts work together. And uh, we'll get on to the word of wisdom a little uh, shortly. But so the gift of word of knowledge and discerning of spirits, they work very closely together. One gives you some information you couldn't know. And the other gives you a uh, discernment to see right through to the problem. So a discerning of spirits is not natural figuring things out by studying a person's body or body language or so on. It's not a natural gift. It's a supernatural where God just reveals to you that's what the problem is. So again, with all of these gifts, we need to learn how to listen and receive from God. Uh, another thing that it is not, so it's not natural, but there's another thing it's not. It's not judging. I want to show you another scripture uh, in Matthew chapter 7. It's not mentioned in there, I don't think. Uh, but in Matthew chapter 7 and the first few verses, discerning of spirits is not the same as as judging in the in the worst sense of judging let's read a few verses in verse one uh, verse one of matthew chapter seven judge not that you be not judged for with the same judgment you judge you will be judged and whatever measure you measure to others it will be measured back to you again so why do you look at the beam of the the, the small speck that's in your brother's eye and you do not consider the beam is in your own eye how will you say to your brother, let me pull out the beam from your eye, the speck from your eye, and behold, there's a beam in your own? Hypocrite, first cast the beam out of your own eye, then you'll see clearly to cast the moat or the speck out of your brother's eye. Don't give that which is holy to dogs, neither cast your, uh, your pearls before swine, lest they trample you under your feet and turn again and render you. All right then, now, let me just go into that scripture. Jesus is speaking about a principle is very important. He's talking about a principle of judging. This word judge means literally to make a decision against someone because of what you see or think you see or whatever and virtually to pass a sentence on them. You are guilty according to the way I've charged you. Therefore, you need to pay the price. So he's talking about having a judgmental attitude. And what he's saying is that if you judge others, you unlock against yourself a spirit of judgment. You, the very thing you've judged will come back to you. Okay, let me just give you an example of that. I uh, had to pray for a woman one time, not so last year, in Taiwan. And she, they sent her in for, for ministry and asked what the problem is. And she said, well, uh, I've got this uh, um, young man interested in marrying me. I said, okay, so what's the deal? And she said, well, we were going out before and then our relationship broke up and I, and I got involved with someone else who had a baby to him and now I've got the baby and now this guy's come back and wants to marry me. So what do you think? Now, she, the people only give you the sanitized version that makes them look really good, you know. So I said, is he a Christian? No, he's not a Christian. I said, well, that, the alarm bells go off for us straight away. And uh, I said, what about this other guy? He said, well, he really would like to marry me too. He's the father of the child. I said, what do you feel in your heart? No, not, not, again, not for that person. I said, well, now tell me then, why did your relationship break up? And she said, well, while I was going out with him, he was unfaithful to me. He had other girls on the side. So I said, well, is there any evidence that that has changed in his life? Is there any reason why he would be different? And he hasn't become a Christian. He hasn't changed in his heart. You, you get, you're in for more of the same. And uh, so why would you want to marry him? She said, no, I really feel he's, he's right for me. I said, well, tell me about your father. And now... Uh, so why would I ask him about the father when it's an issue of marriage? Because the Lord dropped in, there's an issue with her dad. So she said, oh, I don't talk to my dad. I said, why is that? She said, well, mum and dad broke up. They divorced when I was in early teens. I said, really? 
I said, I said, do you have any contact with them? No, no, almost no contact whatsoever. And uh, I said, is that right? And I said, tell me, what was the reason that he, the marriage broke up? And, he, and she said very simply, he was unfaithful to my mother. She said, how many times? She said, three times he was unfaithful to my mother. I said, isn't this extraordinary? You've got a result, you've got a conflict or in your heart with your dad and you have judged him. And now it's replaying in your life again. You, you actually, the judgment you gave out about him, now it's re being replayed back in your life again. Do you not see the connection that what you're struggling with currently actually is an overflow of what's been going on in your past? She couldn't see it. I said, I don't think I can help you then because you're going to go down that route and play this thing right out until you've actually experienced all the consequences of what you've got in your heart towards your father. Now, you understand she had judged her father and found him lacking and now unlocked against herself a real cycle of issues that would then go through the rest of her life. So that's what judging is about. Discerning is being able to, discerning has more to do with being an observer than a judge. For example, a judge will stand up on a, or a judge will usually be seated in an elevated position. So you go into a court, the judge is in the high position. So the, when the Bible talks about judging, it's speaking about elevating yourself up as though you know everything and why people do things and then passing a judgment on someone against them. You found, you found them guilty okay? and now you've condemned them. Right now, this is different to discerning. Discerning, you're not coming from the high ground of pride and being above everyone else. You're coming down from you're actually a human being yourself, understanding that people do have issues and make mistakes, and you're looking as an observer to see what God says about the situation. And so God shows you the root of this is the spirit, the root of this is bitterness, the root of this is this. It's informational. It's not judgmental. It's to inform you of the nature of the problem, not step up on the high ground and look down and find the person guilty and condemn them. That's the difference. Now, many people think that Christians shouldn't judge, but the Bible says the spiritual man judges all things. Notice what Jesus just said in those verses. He said, look, he said, uh, gets those verses back again. Notice he said, don't give what's holy to dogs, neither cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under your feet and turn on you. Clearly, he's saying, you need to know what to share and who to share it with because there's some people if you share it with them it's like casting something out before pigs they'll trample it underfoot and turn on you now he's not being judgmental he's just saying that you have to look at people and look at situations and be un understanding of where they're at and their, how they receive things he said you don't give everything you have to everyone so the Bible's very clear, a spiritual man judges all things. But that means looks right through to what the real issue is and identifies it, not as one sitting up high, looking down, condemning, but as a fellow traveler looking and observing and seeing that something is like this. You get any idea? Okay then. So, uh, for example, uh, and, and, there's, and, and the more you have examples, the easier it is to see it. So discerning then is to be able to look through and see what is behind this matter. I know what they're all saying, or I know what I can see, but what lies behind it that's the driving factor? And we need discernment, because in the, in, in, in the world and in the church, people have all kinds of agendas. And it shouldn't be that way, but that's how people are. People have usually hidden agendas, and the agendas are not so obvious, but if you have discerning of spirits, you can often pick what lies behind it. So there are a number of Bible examples of that. We shared with one of you in the last session, and that was uh, found in, uh, in, in Acts chapter 8, where Peter discerned the motives of Simon the sorcerer. So everyone was coming up and saying, we want the power of God, we want the power of God, we want the power of God. He came up and said, listen, I'll give you some money, just give me the power of God. And he was able to look in and say, no, you have got an issue. He said, underneath this desire for the power of God is a deep root of bitterness and a crookedness that makes you seek power so you can promote yourself. You've got a deep-rooted issue of insecurity in your life. And Paul, uh, Peter, discerned it. He saw right 
the root of it and confronted the man about it. Get any idea? So discernment enables you to see what is really there, and as you'll see shortly, we'll need a word of wisdom to know what to do with it. So um, uh, in Luke chapter 13, I'll just find another example in Luke chapter 13, uh, in Luke chapter 13 and verse 10, and uh, Jesus was teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed down and could not lift herself up. And Jesus saw her, called her to him, and said to her, Woman, be loosed of your infirmity. He laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Now, Jesus is in a synagogue, a place of prayer, and there's a woman who has an incredibly serious back problem. She's bent and crippled right over. Now, to everyone who looked, it's a back problem. And she has a back problem, that's true. But he saw the root source is a demonic spirit. There's a spirit attached to her spine and when she was delivered immediately she was set free I had a situation in Fiji I was invited by one of the members of our church to go up with him to his property up in Yasawas which is beautiful that's beautiful area of Fiji and uh, it's but it's very remote it's right at the outer end of the Fiji area and right up in the outer islands so we in order to get there we had to catch a boat and then we had to kind of catch a little boat ashore all of that kind of thing and then we were invited to a meeting for me to speak at a meeting in the village. So to get there, we waded out into the surf, got into a boat and traveled around through the, through the uh, reefs and landed on another beach. And someone met us with a lamp and we went in and we were in a building. And I, I was the first white man to speak there, apparently. And there was a gathering of people there. The men had fled the place. They heard I was coming. They fled. And there was a problem with spiritism and witchcraft going on in that area. So I went into the meeting. At the end of the meeting, uh, there was a lady came up, and she, when I say came up, she crawled up. She crawled herself up, and she, she came up there, and I could see that she's, she was in trouble from her waist down, that she actually could not walk. She had come with two, uh, two crutches. She was unable to walk. And so I looked at her, and I said, I asked some questions. First of all, how long have you been like this? She said, 10 years. Then the Lord just dropped into my heart exactly what the problem is. So how did I get it? I got one, discerning a spirit, and two, word of knowledge. The first word of knowledge was it had to do with her husband. The second was discerning. It was actually a spirit of infirmity associated with the occult. So I asked her the questions then, and this is how you can bring out revelation. You just ask questions. I said, what happened 10 years ago? She said, I said, did someone near you, close to you, die? She said, my husband died. I said, is it not true that he was involved in the occult, in witchcraft? She said, yes. Now, this was very significant because this is a religious community. Everyone's supposedly Christians, but actually, then many of them were not, and many of them were practicing witchcraft, and this was why the guy got me to come over, because the conditions he described, I could tell, were witchcraft was operating. Everyone was denying it, including the local minister. This brought it right out into the light. So now the woman's saying, yes, my husband was involved in witchcraft. He was involved in spiritism. And I said, the Lord shows me, because the two of you will become one through marriage, that when he died, that spirit has come into you. You have a spirit of infirmity associated with your husband. And so, and the witchcraft. So now everyone's absolutely stunned. And so I commanded, I broke the curse. I broke the, the, the soul ties to her husband. I broke the curses that have been upon her through her husband's activities, commanded the spirit of infirmity to go, helped her to her feet, and she stood up and she walked without crutches. She walked home. So you see again, the, the spirit, discerning of spirits helps you know what the issue is. And it's, you get a revelation, you get it from God. Any idea? So we've seen a number, a number. So the, the, the gift of uh, discerning of spirits enables you, one, to discern the activity of the Holy Spirit, Two, to discern what the motives of people are. Three, to discern the activity of demonic spirits and identify what they are. Now, it, it would help if I just shared a little bit about your senses and how they work. Um, we touched on it before. You have natural senses and you have spiritual senses. So your natural senses, uh, after a little while, you gain a memory bank of experiences. So you smell food. Oh, curry sergeants in the building <laughs> so you know we we sort of you, you know 
you, you, you identify with a physical sensation, you have a memory, you attach to it, and you identify it like that. So after a little while, you can pick up lots of things. You can recognize voices. Someone rings up and they don't tell you who they are. Oh, I know that voice. I recognize that voice. So we attach uh, associations to the, to the experiences we have naturally. Now, spiritually, the same thing happens. You are a spirit being and do have spiritual senses and you do pick up stuff. People often call it a sixth sense, but it's actually your spirit man. Well, for example, how many of you have uh, had some decision you had to make, but you felt this terrible uneasiness and lack of peace about that? How many have known that experience like that? Okay, very good. And of course, if you went against that and did it, you ended up in trouble. We won't ask about that. <laughs> you put that down to wisdom, okay? Now, so that's one thing. All right, how many of you have met a person, especially a woman, have met a person and that person was uh, just a male. It's incredibly creepy. There's something about them. Oh, it's weird. Don't go near me. Don't I feel defiled just being near you, okay? So how many, how many women would identify that experience? Quite a lot of women, okay. So probably the second thought that came into your mind was I shouldn't think like that. But actually, you were right. What's happening is you're discerning an unclean spirit or intention around the person and you're feeling, up the you're feeling the impressions of it and you're identifying it as a yuck. I don't like this. I don't trust that man. I'll stay away. You understand? That's actually discernment. Your spirit is sensing things. You've got to learn how to recognize what it is and how to work with it. I'll show you what to do in a moment. Okay, so, um, uh, or, so and men have a similar kind of thing. You may find yourself in situations, or have you ever been into a house, for example, and you go in there to meet some couple, and as you go in there, everyone's being polite and nice, but you can feel like the whole atmosphere is full of tension, as though there's been a big row or something going on there. How many? Now, let me ask you this then. How on earth did you feel tension? What part of you felt that? So your spirit felt it. So all of us have a human spirit, and all of us can sense things, but we can develop that so we become sharper at it and become more used to dealing with it. Any idea? Okay, then. Now, so, so you have ability then to sense things spiritually, and when we're born again, of course, that whole, it's brought to a different realm altogether. We now have the Holy Spirit with us. He can actually identify for us what the things are that we're dealing with. So here's a thing. Remember... In almost all of the moving in the spirit, what you get seems to be a thought or impression or picture comes into your mind. It's not strong necessarily or very big. It, you could easily sweep it aside if you didn't stop and focus on it. So the way to deal with it is simply this. Is, and I, I think there's an, a couple of practical things. Number one, I think we need to ask the Lord to help us to deal with having a judgmental attitude. You can never discern properly if you have a judging attitude. You notice what Jesus said in Matthew 7? He said, he said this. He said, if you judge, you'll be judged. The measure you give to others is how it'll come back to you. Then he said an interesting thing. He said, why do you say I want to get the speck out of your eye when you've got a big beam in your own? Notice then what he said. In other words, he's saying, I'll put it to you a different way. If you had a little speck in your eye, you wouldn't ask someone to help you dig it out who had this huge log covering most of their vision. You'd say, no way do you get near my eye. You can't see clearly. You'll mess this up. You'll damage me and hurt me. Right? Now, so what Jesus then said was he said, take the beam out of your own eye, speaking of judgment, and then you'll see clearly. So what he's putting it another way, he's saying, if you have a judgment in your heart against any person or you hold judgments about certain matters, it will affect how you see and interpret what's in front of you in life. So in the journey of growing in the things of the Spirit, we need to deal with bitterness and judgments and unforgiveness in our heart because it will color how we see people. It will color how we interpret life. It will affect our ability to discern we will tend to judge rather than discern and think we're completely right and justified. Does that make sense to you? Very, very important. So if I was to 
allow my, the Lord to help me deal with any judging attitude in my heart against myself or against people and to begin to meditate on the love of God and his great love for me and grow in that love, I will see clearly because when you love people, you see clearly. When you have judgment in your heart, you can't see clearly and you mess it up every time. So this is an important thing. I need to cultivate purity of heart in my motives towards people or I can't see very clearly. So, uh, so that's a very, very important. I'll just stop from that point and then just move on to it. So how can you work in this area? So just give me, I'll give you an example of it. A person, uh, I, I used this illustration recently because I've had this experience. Uh, there's two people standing in, a, in the entrance of a church and one of them has got a deep rejection in his life or a judgment that there's something wrong with me, people don't like me. He learned that years ago. Another one hasn't got that at all, he's quite free. And suppose uh, uh, the pastor walks in and he's very, very busy, preoccupied. And he walks past and both say, hello, pastor. And he just doesn't hear. He didn't hear it. He was preoccupied. So there's no willing rejection of them. He just didn't hear and carried on. Now, each of them has had an experience, an identical experience. Each of them will interpret it. Now, one can, the one who's got the rejection and judgment in his heart will pass judgment on what it means. He'll say, this means he doesn't like me. And they'll get angry, won't enjoy the service at all. He'll be angry all through the service, but doesn't like me. And, you know, and it all stir up all his anger over, over the... But the judgment was in his own heart. The other person looks and says, oh, I can't hear what I had to... Can't have noticed me, he must have been busy, I'll catch up with him later. Two people, same experience, but responded completely different. One just observed it and worked out a different strategy. The other judged it and ended up in turmoil. Any idea? So, so if you've got judgments in your heart, it'll filter all discernment. So discernment, need, you, it practice ridding your heart of judgments about people and learn to be an observer. To be an observer, you ask the question, I wonder what this means, rather than this means that. Okay? You ask the question, what does this mean? What am I feeling? What am I sensing? What does this mean? You let God help you see his perspective on it. Jesus said, I don't judge as the world judges. He said, I judge righteously. I don't judge what I see, I judge by what my father says to me. So he judged things on what he heard from God. So how can I develop the, the area of discerning of spirits? Very, very simply, one, I need to deal with the issue of judging in my heart that will cloud my ability to sense. Two, I can develop my sensitivity through fasting. Fasting and prayer helps me develop sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. And then what you need to do is learn how to identify what you feel when you're in different situations. Identify impressions you have when you're talking with someone, when you are meeting someone, when you come into a meeting, when you come into a room, when you go to different places. Look for chances to identify what your first impression is. The first impression is usually the one that impacts you as you engage something. Then you just move out of that and start to reason everything out and interact with it differently. But when you're a spiritual person, at which you are, you tend to be more sensitive. So you can feel things or sense things quite easily. And so try to, when you sense something, ask this question, what do I sense? What impression do I have? What am I feeling? Try to just get a name for it. Don't dismiss it. Just inquire, Holy Spirit, what is that? Then the next question, what do you want me to do with that? What does this mean? If you judge it must mean this, you've then lost your discernment. If you just say, Lord, what does this mean? How do you want me to deal with this? You'll start to then uh, develop a lifestyle being able to discern things. So there's heaps of places that you can pick it up. So one of the places to pick it up is when you meet people. When you meet people, just come with an open heart and shake them a hand and look them right in the eyes and just let them interact with you. And as they interact with you, you'll have an impression come. Try to identify what the impression is. Listen for the things the Holy Spirit drops in your heart. You walk into someone's house, what impression do you get? What does the atmosphere feel like? You walk into a church meeting, what does it feel like? What does the atmosphere feel like? When the, everyone's worshipping or, or things are happening, what does it feel like? What does it sense is there? Develop practice discerning or exercising your senses to listen and identify impressions you have about situations and then act as an observer, not a judge. Oh, that's interesting. I'm feeling this. wonder how I should respond. I wonder what God wants me to do. So 
So you don't move into judging mode. You stay in discerning, working with the Holy Spirit mode. Now notice Paul went for several days before he turned around to the woman and rebuked the Spirit. In other words, he waited until he had actual wisdom from God what he should do. You notice this, if he had, if he had stopped and reacted on the first day, he'd have, had, he'd have been in jail straight away and had no chance to do any ministry at all. So he didn't immediately address what he could see was the problem until he felt the Holy Spirit show him, this is what you need to do, do it today. A lot of people can't handle that. They, they pick something up, they want to deal with it straight away. Now, this isn't always how God works, because dealing with it straight away can create more problems than what you, you may solve one, but you've actually created something bigger and different. So if Paul, for example, had turned and rebuked the Spirit that same day, all those days that he was able to preach and minister would have been cut out and cancelled short like that. So he knew there was a spirit, but waited till the right time, then turned and dealt with it, and that triggered off a reaction in the whole city towards him, and shortly after he exited the city. So we need to know and be able to discern what God is saying or what God is uh, wanting us to learn, and we need to be able to identify those sensations and impressions we have. So just all you do is just identify what did you feel. You're on a phone to someone. We used to teach this when people were doing phone ministry to people. After you get off the phone, just quiet down and just worship the Lord and just sense what are you feeling in your spirit. I'll give you an example. I had someone uh, that I spoke to and they were incredibly angry. And they were angry with me. And I thought, that's interesting. I wonder why they're angry with me. So we checked it out. And this is what had happened. They had been talking with someone else who had an unresolved offense and was angry at me. And after being with them, they came away angry at me as well. So what had happened was they had not discerned this person has an offense and the biblical way of dealing with the offense is put it right with the person. They, they came under the influence of the spirit of anger and bitterness over the person. It affected them and they were then operating with that thing around their life. So I always ask people, after you've been in an interaction, how did you feel? What did you sense? What are you sensing in your spirit? Just practice doing it. Try to identify the sensations, identify the feelings. And then we need wisdom from God what to do. So in the next session, we will look at the word of wisdom and where to go with that and, and how, to, uh, how to respond to that. But I'll get you now to just do some interaction. We'll get to some activations. I think you need to do something now, otherwise you fall asleep. Okay then. <laughs> Okay then, so listen, we've got heaps of, uh, of uh, things that we could do, but I'm going to give you one that's an interesting one, and uh, this one there will challenge you a bit. So you'll, you'll need a pen and a paper to do this one, because you're going to write something. You need a bit of space. If you, if you need a bit of space, you can move your chair out. And this is what we're going to do. This, is, this, this activation is called inspired writing. Inspired writing. So you've had an inspired picture, Inspired thought, inspired prayer, this is inspired writing. So if it has a heavy piece of paper, or write it on the cover at the back of the, of, the, of the manual, it'll be fine. And I want you to write up this question. Write up this question. And you're going to listen to let God speak to you about you. Okay, so, I'll tell you. so here's the question you write up. Lord, how do you see me? Lord, how do you... Write it down exactly as I said it. Lord, how do you see me? Now, this is your prayer or question to the Lord. And what we're going to do is just going to pray for a little while. And just now we're going to do this just like you were ministering to someone, except you're just coming into a place where you're listening to let God speak to yourself. If you can get into a flow of this, this will be one of the greatest assets to you over the course of your life to help you hear from God and develop hearing from God. And it's called journaling. And journaling's got a number of aspects, but this aspect of journaling, one aspect of journaling is just writing your thoughts and feelings experience. This aspect is journaling what God is saying to you. So you ask the question, God or oh Lord, how do you see me? Now I know how you, some of you see yourself and you may not see yourself too good. You come to all kinds of conclusions about yourself wouldn't it be good if you stopped listening to all of that junk and instead, Lord, how do you see me? 
you might find it a little hard to take how he sees you because it's very loving and very kind. And it's not like others who you may have experienced. So he can be incredibly kind and loving. And so what I want you to do is we're going to do very simply like we did the others. We would say, you know, hey, uh, can I practice on you? Well, this is just a practice. You're practicing on yourself. Okay, then, and very positive response, yes, this is going to be great. And then we're just going to pray in tongues for a little bit. And I want you to pray in tongues and then begin to focus on just begin to think about the Lord, think about his goodness to you. And then you may start to get him, just some thought come to mind, start to write. Now, don't try and work out what you're going to write next. Uh, uh, you're a loser. <laughs> yeah, don't, try, don't, don't work it out, you know. You may get terrible things if you try and work it out. and You certainly won't hear God on that. So what you do is just relax listening to him until you sort of start to get a thought or an idea and then start to write. Now just relax as you write and just let it flow. Let it flow out of your writing, flow and flow and flow. And if you find the flow stops, just rest again. Thank you, Lord. Lord, just speak to me. Give me more, Lord. And just stay focused on him and then just continue writing and begin to write again. What will happen is, Right from the flow that comes from your spirit, don't try and figure this out with your head. If you try and figure it out with your head, you'll be completely limited. You won't have revelation. God actually wants to speak to you. Now, you could pro it's like prophesying over yourself, virtually. And here's the interesting thing. When you learn how to do this, you can do this any day you like, all the rest of your life. You can ask the Lord questions. And begin to journal what he has to say to you. For some it may be very lots of things to say. Some it may be just a few lines. Hey, we're just practicing. Ready? Okay then. And some may have a blank paper. That's okay too. All it may, and, and if you find you have a blank, that's interesting. I have a blank. I wonder why I can speak to others about what God sees about them. I'm finding it hard to speak to myself. How, what's going on here? Why is there that block? Can you see, it's like instead of being a judge, you just be the observer and the listener and the one who shares what you're observing and hearing. It's a very, very important positioning in your heart to take where you don't become a judge anymore in life. You become an observer. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder what that means. Lord, how would you have me respond? So in this one, Lord, how do you see me? How do you see me, Lord? How do you see me? Lord, I just reach out to you now. So come on, let's just begin to pray in tongues. And then we'll give you just a few minutes to write. And if you're looking at this on the internet, you could sit down with a piece of paper and uh, you could do this too. Write down the question, Lord, how do you see me? Just begin to pray, pray in tongues. Just worship God for a little while. And then as a thought comes to you, begin to write. And you're writing a letter to yourself like you're writing from God to you. You're putting words to what God's saying. Let's do it together, shall we? Thank you, Lord. Lord, release the spirit of revelation right now. I think it would be quite good if we put the air con on too. I think I need to cool down a bit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, begin to speak to individuals here. Reveal the tremendous, amazing love, the wonderful heart that you have for each of us. Let it just flow out of their hearts onto paper. Thank you, Lord. We just bind every distracting influence, everything that would hinder us, stop us, and we just release that life and vitality now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. As soon as you feel free and start to get an idea, just begin to write. You're not trying to work it. You're just writing out of the flow of what's in your heart, like you're listening to someone dictate to you and you're writing it. And you're actually writing it to yourself. And it's this flow of the Spirit coming up from within. If you get stuck, just pray in tongues, relax, and refocus on the Lord again.
right then. How are we doing? I see a lot of people are writing and all got to different levels. Let me just ask for a little bit of feedback. How many had a flow of writing? You had some thoughts come to you that came from the Lord. You obviously felt a flow of things start to come. It's all right then. Did anyone get stuck? You just went blank. No one got completely stuck. Did some find that just had a little bit, but there wasn't much flow in it? Some had that. There would be always some like that. And sometimes that can reflect that we're not good writers. We're better talkers. And uh, we talk better than we write. But uh, again, relax and let the flow come. How many of you have found that what God spoke to you was very personal? Actually, it was extremely specific for you. How many found that? Wow, that's great. How many were quite encouraged by what God said? Oh, that's really good too. Well, this is very, very good. How many of you, God told you how much he loved you? <laughs> he often starts with that and, uh, and, and talks with that. How many of you, did God give you some kind of direction or insight to what you need to be doing at this time in your life? Isn't that good? Wow, that's great, isn't it? That's helpful, isn't it? So it's quite good for you to come to the Lord and to learn how to journal daily with him because, and keep a track record of what God is speaking to you because you can go back and look at it again. And uh, if you have a journal and you're keeping a journal and God is talking to you, it still helps if you've got someone else who you can run your thoughts around or run your thoughts with before you make any major decisions, just so you've got the wisdom. The Bible says in the wisdom of many counselors, there's safety. So this is a great way. Uh, it, it also has limits on it. And so it's helpful if we stay having counsel about any major decisions. So there's many questions you could start to ask the Lord now. Huh? So we just asked you, how does he see you? And he would talk about the goodness and the good things he sees in you, the possibilities in you. So you could ask about how he sees your church. You could ask about uh, various aspects. And then wait on the Lord. Just let him talk with you about life and about things. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great? Thank you, Lord. How many people were quite surprised by what God shared with them? Gave you a bit of a surprise. Oh, that's interesting. What was it surprised you? Wow. Right. Wow. 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 So it's very specific and it's picture even as you are, you're precious. That wonderful. So God assured he had a plan. He's precious as she is, but that plan will bring enlargement and greatness. That's wonderful. Don't you love that? Such a wonderful thing. So you're in a good space now to be able to minister to someone else. So what we'll do now is get you to break into pairs. And what I'd like you to do is to bring a word of encouragement. Now, it's not a, we're not going to prophesy. That would be too spiritual for us. What we'll just do is we'll just bring an inspired word for someone. So again, we'll get with someone that preferably someone you have not prayed with before. Someone that's different. And remember, ask permission. Can I, can I just uh, can I practice on you? Get a good positive response. And then uh, we pray in tongues, pray in the Spirit for a little bit. And then listen and then share something that you feel God shows them that would encourage them. You've just done it for yourself. Now do it for the other person. So you're looking for a thought and an idea. Remember, pray, relax and focus on the source, listening, just waiting. And just let thoughts just come. Something drops into your mind. Focus on it till it comes a little clearer. Then start to share. Well, I just sensed this as I was praying for you. Keep it simple and easy and light. Okay? Let's see how we do. Find someone and let's have a practice. If you're watching this on the internet, why don't you find someone to practice on, especially someone you don't know so well. Okay, let's just come back. Let's close up what you're doing. Let's... Uh, Get some feedback on how it's going. How many of you were really touched by what the person shared with you? It was very appropriate for you. Wow, that's wonderful. Great. How many sort of felt God as they shared with you? Oh my, that's God speaking to me. How many felt that? Very good. Wonderful. Okay then. Anyone got blocks in this? How many have struggled to get something? 
Okay, we've all moved quite a long way now. That's fantastic. How many of you, it still just feels like it's you doing it. You kind of think, so much seems like me. I don't sort of feel much of God in it. How many found that? Actually, that's quite, that's quite normal. To tell the truth, some of the best ministries I've had to people, I didn't feel a thing. You just, but I have learned to just relax and, and understand I am a spirit being. God is in me. And if I will yield, he will speak through me. Whether I feel anything much or experience anything is irrelevant. It's not about me. It's for the other person. I'm just the servant to bring about the work. Once you get that idea, we're just there to serve people. It's not about your feelings or experiences at all. It's actually what God does in their life. It's about them and God. And of course, as you do it, you just grow so immensely. Amen. Okay, so you found that's been a good challenge for you? Okay, then. Would you like to stretch out a little further, try a little something harder? A little bit harder? No, please don't make it any harder. <laughs> okay. All right, then. Well, this is this one. I just need someone to help me. Just need a volunteer, really. Someone who can help me. Okay, you're going to help me. All right, then. All right, okay. So just come on up here. Now, this is what I want us to do this time. Uh, we're going to get you to do two things. The first thing is I want you to do is to see if you can get a word of knowledge about the person. In other words, a little piece of information that we wouldn't have known naturally. Now, I do know Carolyn, so I've got to then dismiss from my mind everything I know about her. I have to just literally push aside and listen to my heart, not listen to my mind. If I go anywhere towards what I know, then I won't hear my spirit at all. So I've got to just push aside anything I may know about her and then actually just identify what I'm feeling in my spirit. All right, then, so, and I want to show you just simply how you can remember we share with you for getting words and knowledge about the body. Just, just begin to think about a person's body, and you may just find is it the right side, the left side, is it, you know, and just go through the parts of the body, and you may feel drawn to a part, just only the slightest draw. That can be what a word of knowledge is, just the slightest little impression. So, what we're going to do is we're going to look for an area where the person is facing a struggle. We're asking this question Lord, is there any person? any area of this person's life where they're facing a struggle. Okay? And we'll show you just how to do that in just a moment. And then the second part will be, now, Lord, how do you want to speak to them to encourage them? Okay? So the first is the word of knowledge. The second is the prophetic. The word of knowledge, is there an area where there is a struggle going on? Second part, is there something God wants to say to help the person in that part of their life? So if God identifies the struggle, he certainly will want to do something to help them. And there could be many ways they could be helped, but at this point, the level of help we'll give is we'll look for a word of comfort and inspiration and encouragement for them, okay? That keeps it quite an evil level. And we're not trying to prophesy. We're actually just see if we can find out a little piece of information. Now, remember when we asked you in the second activation of the series, go to someone and ask them a question. Find out something about them. So... Now we're going to ask the Lord questions. So you've already done it for yourself. Lord, how do you see me? You know you can ask God a question and he will answer. So now we've got to, in love, say, Lord, is there any area this person is struggling? There may well be there's none. And if there's none, then there's none. Don't make one up. <laughs> Don't put on them your struggle. <laughs> Is there a struggle? And if there is a struggle, see if you can frame up what it might be and then uh, lay out then just we need to look to God for a word for the person. Okay? All right then. So just come and stand in front of me there. So if I have to pray and minister to a person, there's a number of ways. If you, ju you can just say, well, God, just show me and just wait for something to happen. That's one way. Or you can use your imagination a little bit and just reach into different areas. Now, for most people in their life, there's not a lot of areas that they would have a struggle. If you think about it, if I was to look and to just look, say, back through Caroline to her family background, she could have a struggle with her father and mother in the family. So if I was just to mentally just look, has there been a struggle there? Yes or no? No, I don't feel anything. Okay? 
It's all right then. Well, that's all right then. So if she's a married person, then I might look, is this the, someone on the right, the, the person standing next to them, is there a struggle there? No. All right, that's okay. All right, are there children? I look down because there's offspring. So I would look, is there some issue there that there's a trouble? No. All right, then, so what other areas are left? Well, is there trouble in the body? Just look at her. Is there an area of sickness or struggle going on? No. All right, then, so then we look then, what other areas are there? Well, is it work-related? Or is it finance-related, relationship-related, or ministry? It's not so many areas. We've covered most areas of a person's life now. So if I just mentally just stop and look, and, and while I'm listening, I'm just mentally going around, is there any one of those I'm drawn to, then I may just find a draw to one of them. And so I'll just stop for a moment, and if I feel the draw there, then there's something going on there that I need to be able to get a word from God for. Okay? So it's not such a hard thing. So if I just, can I practice on you? Great stuff. And, and so bearing in mind, I've got to dismiss anything I might know, and now just begin to look into the Lord. So Holy Spirit, you just know everything about Caroline. You know, Lord, where her life is at at this point. And Lord, you can just reveal things that you want to help her and encourage her. So Lord, I'm just asking you, Lord, just show me where there's any area of struggle. So I'll just start to mentally now do what I'm going to do, is just go looking in each area, just mentally reaching in to see if God will show me something. So I reach in the background. I don't feel God quickening. There could be an issue or something, but not, God's not wanting to do that today. So I don't have to worry. I'm not trying to make something happen. I'm just looking and inquiring. I'm just an observer listening for God. Okay? So I could reach in there. Is there anything there? No. Reaching in then. Marriage, no, there's nothing there. Reaching then, are there any children? No, there's nothing there. So then, what other areas? Oh, and I just become conscious of her hand, and I'm thinking finance. And I could look around all the other areas, but I might just stop there. And so I'll just stop. Thank you, Lord. And I sense that's a struggle area. So I could say, Lord, what is the struggle? And what do you want to say to help her in this area? It could be other areas of struggle. So we can pray for two or three people, and you may pick up all, people pick up all kinds of different things. But this is not about knowing a problem. It's about loving a person. It's not about being nosy. It's about finding a way that, to bring God to them in their struggle. Because when you have a struggle, you get preoccupied with it. It overwhelms you. It gets out of perspective, and you feel alone. And so if you identify a struggle a person has, even if you don't go into all the details of it, then, and you bring something from God, it can bring tremendous comfort. All right then, so Father, I just thank you. Well, what I sensed was there's a struggle around finance, as though there's not enough, and as though it seems like there's never been enough. And it's been quite a difficult situation for you to manage because in your heart you don't feel there's enough for you. God wants you to know that he is your source and supply, that you can trust in him. Have you ever gone without? Have you ever gone in lack or need? Have you ever suffered? The Lord says, I've always been there to provide for you. And I know the pressure and difficulty you're feeling right now, but the Lord says, I will help you. I will give you victory in this area that's been a struggle for you. I will help you come from the place of struggle into the place of rest and the place of abundance. The Lord says, in me there is always more than enough. Right then. Now, I'm going to go a little further because I feel God wants to help her, wants to minister to her. So you notice we've just touched an area. I didn't go and expose all kinds of details or anything. But there's enough has come for me to be aware God wants to comfort and help her in the midst of the struggle. Now, you notice what I said with struggles, there's also a lot of emotion and pain in it. But with this particular struggle, I feel a spirit has come against her to continually uh, tell her there's not enough. There's something has rested on her. So even in good times and when there was enough, there's never been enough. See, it doesn't matter how wealthy you are, if there's a spirit sits on you and your heart believes there's not enough, there's not enough. Because you can't see there's enough. 
You just can't see it. You're in torment all the time. And then there's a wrestling goes on. So what God's given you, you can't enjoy because of the torment. So I found that people enter into peace, not because of how much they have, but because they find contentment in their heart and learn to live within the framework that God has given them. Godliness and contentment is tremendous gain. So let me just pray. Thank you, Lord. Now, this has come over you a long time ago. This came over you when you were a young girl. It came over you in the midst of turmoil. It's come around your life through your mother. And God wants to help you today, wants to break the belief there's not enough for me. He wants you to see that he's a God of abundance and will help you in every situation. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I break the ungodly belief that there's not enough for me. I break the ungodly belief of financial failure and poverty. I come against fear and the spirit of poverty loose right now in Jesus' name. Let your presence and peace just come over her life. Thank you, Lord. There it is. God, just touching you now. Just bring rest around your life. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Holy Ghost. Let's stay there and just enjoy him. Now, did you notice all I did was just start to just look, waiting, listening on God to give me something. If he doesn't give anything, that's okay. I'm not going to nose. It's just I have a heart to love the person and help them. And so because of that, we're willing to just look and reach into God for something for the person. Now, sometimes God can just drop it in and you didn't even do any of that. But I'm trying to provide for you a, an approach that you can grow in this gift area. You understand that actively pursuing is always a vital part of it. And so I just look, background the parents, spouse, children, uh, finance, uh, work, relationships, ministry. Is there any of those areas? And that pretty well covers everything. And, and so in the midst of looking like that, God can just cause you to be drawn to something feel a struggle around a relationship. Well, wonder what the struggle is or what the relationship is. And as you, you don't have to get all the details, but if you can get a little bit of detail, then now you've opened up the person and God, what does God want to do to help them? Amen. Bless you. How was that for you? Um, I'd just like, can I just share something? Sure. Yes. So I don't know with other people, but it's like you feel sometimes the need is so deep and so great and, mm. and the whole thing so big in your life. Yeah. That there's not enough of God. <laughs> I don't know whether that's connected. Yeah, they are connected, too. yeah. Yeah. Whether that's yeah. Because uh, Kelly sort of brought me to a place recently of being well <laughs> of where I've been okay mm. with what I've got. Right. And Right. Yes, of course. So that's so I don't know whether that's I didn't say that. anything about that area. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, actually, you, I haven't yeah. been. Uh, he's sort of told me to stay away from shops, and actually, yeah. I feel I've been. The yeah. spirit of materialism has almost sort of been broken yeah. in my life right. because of that. Because that's I've great. Been obedient, so. Right. So, yeah. so this is obviously, and in, in what's shared is in line with what God is speaking to you about this area in your life right now. Oh, definitely. Yeah, that is it's wonderful. Not to be impulsive, no. Great. <laughs> and hence today. <laughs> well, thank you for your honesty. Let's give her a clap. I just appreciate it. Remember, the ministry of the Spirit is always gentle and loving. He said, so when Paul is writing about the gifts of the Spirit in Romans 12 and Romans 14, in the middle of it, he stops and he said, you have to be loving. Of all things be loving, or this is very empty and doesn't represent what Christ is like. So the power ministry is wonderful, but we have to be loving of people, honoring of people, valuing of people in the flow of the ministry. So we don't do things that would embarrass them. And you can word things in ways that are not embarrassing. I could just say, well, you know, do you have a struggle or is there a difficulty in your life in this area? Is there something going on? And just put it in the form of a question. Or you, if God spoke to you more clearly, you may just put it, I feel this. Uh, so God has got to show you, and we'll talk about that when we get to words of wisdom. So why don't you all have a try and have a practice? Hey, how about that? Oh, that's very excited response, isn't it, eh?
So what we'll do for this one here, what we're going to do is this. I'd like you just in this time, instead of all of you just going at your own pace and rate, we've let it free run. I'd like us just to do it as a just a step by step. So what I'll do is I'll encourage you where to look. Otherwise, you just get there and you can't remember everything. Oh, oh, oh yeah, you know, and where to go. So what I'll do is we're just going to do it step by step, and I'll and I'll guide you. And all I want you to do is just be open to the Lord. And if you feel a draw around something, just identify it, and then that's it. That's all you need. That's my one. You know, there may be others, but you won't worry about those. The one you feel that that's the draw on, or that's the yeah, I feel something draws me over that one. That's the one you just hold in your mind, and then we'll ask the Lord for what to say. Okay? All right, then, so get in peace, especially with someone you don't know. Okay, let's get in peace. You can come out the front here, over the sides. Okay. All right, now I want you just to do this. Uh, if you're watching this on internet, you can just follow it through step by step. Just leave the volume on and the picture on. And you can walk through it step by step and then later on turn it all off and just try it without me uh, guiding you in it. So, but for this session, we're going to just guide you step by step. Okay, so the first thing is, of course, what we've done. Smile and look at the person. Can I practice on you? Give a very positive response. Okay. All right, then. Now, uh, you may know a little bit about the person. Uh, please just push aside all you know, because if you look in that area of what you know, you'll just have turmoil. You've got to be listening for God. You're listening for the impression of the Holy Spirit. So let's just begin to pray quietly and just worship God just for a, just for a little moment there. Just begin to worship the Lord. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We thank you know everything about this person. You love them deeply. And you're so willing to help them right where they are right now. Okay, now just go quiet. I want you to look with me. There's the person standing in front of you. It looked like you were looking behind them. And in the background behind them are their parents, the father, the mother. Is there a problem there between the parents or with the father, with the mother? Do you sense something there? All right, then, now, just look to the left of that person. Maybe there's a spouse. Maybe there's an issue in a relationship. Is there a difficulty or a challenge there? Yes or no? Do you feel a draw there? What is that problem? Then look like you're looking down at their feet. Are there children? Is there a problem in family? challenge, something that's creating difficulty. Now look over to the right of the person, their workplace, what they do. Is there a challenge they're experiencing? I just look at the person again. Is there a problem in their body? Is there some struggle that they're having internally? Is there a difficulty in a relationship? Then look upward. Are they having a struggle in their walk with God? Perhaps you've felt something there. I'll just go back through them again. And, and as I go through them, if you feel a draw on one of these, just stop and inquire, what is the struggle, Lord? How do you want me to, what do you want to say to them to share with them? Is it a problem in their background with their father or their mother, their family? Is there a problem with a spouse? Is there a problem in the family? Is there a struggle in some relationship? Is there a struggle at work, financially? Is there a struggle in their ministry? Is there a struggle inside themselves? 
what is the struggle? How, Lord, give me something to encourage them. So just begin very simply. Well, I just felt an impression that there's a struggle going on in this part of your life. May it be it's this. Just be quite gentle and easily entreated over it. And then share what God has given you and share what God is saying to encourage the person. Let's just do it and see what God does. Okay, first one begin to share. <laughs> I get change over so the other one shared
Okay, let's close our sharing and let's get some feedback how it went. <laughs> All right, then, okay, just sit down for a moment. Let's just see what, how people got on. How many, uh, the pers how many people had this experience they identified exactly an area of struggle that you had. How many had that experience? Person identified very clearly. That was very good. How many of you found it was a struggle to get that one? So, because <laughs> a bit more specific, you're reaching into an area. That's okay. Okay, how many of you were deeply touched by what we shared with you? It really helped you. Well, that's wonderful. Come on, give yourselves a clap then. Very, very good. <laughs> <laughs> well done, well done. Okay, so you can see that you approach it with an where focus is on Jesus and we are listening and observing and seeking to find something. That's the spirit that you work in. It's a one of inquiry and observing and then sharing what God is giving you. Quite, it's not, not um, uh, over the top or way out there. It's quite gentle flow of the spirit. You can pra everyone can practice these things. So I want to share with you, we'll have a coffee break shortly. I want to share with you a little bit on the word of wisdom, and uh, then we'll have a break for afternoon tea. So you've done very, very well. So the word of wisdom, that's section 15 in your notes. Wisdom is a great gift. Wisdom is knowing what to do. Wisdom is knowing what to do and when to do it. And how to do it. <laughs> wisdom is knowing what to do, when to do it, how to do it. So we face many challenges in life, and in ministry, when you're working to minister to someone, if God gives you a word of knowledge, you need wisdom to know what to do with it. If God gives you prophecy, you need wisdom to know what to do with it. If God gives you discernment, you need wisdom to know what to do with it. So the wisdom is a very important gift to get, and word of wisdom doesn't to get a word of wisdom does not make you a wise person. You are wise for five minutes. That's it. <laughs> I'm sorry. And it doesn't stick because five minutes later you can be very foolish. So the word of wisdom does not make you a wise person. It does not make you a spiritual person. It means someone smarter than you shared with you something very smart. That's really what it is. All it is. Someone who was very wise shared with you something that was surprisingly wise and appropriate. So the word of wisdom is just, in, it's, an, it's a revelation from the Lord what to do in a certain situation, when to do it, and how to do it. Remember I shared with you a story about buying a gift for my grandmother. Only God could have known what to get and what would do the trick. Only he knew. And so listening to him, I was able to get wisdom and get an outcome that far surpassed anything I could naturally do. So we need words of wisdom. So to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. It's the first one mentioned in the list of the gifts of the Spirit is the word of wisdom. It is a great gift to pursue. God, give me wisdom to know what to do. In James 1, it says, If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives freely to all men, but let him ask in faith, not doubting, for he that doubts is like the waves just tossed this way and that way. So if you're going to ask God for wisdom, expect him to give it to you. And then you've got to step out that what he's given to you is the right thing to do and the right way to do it and the right time to do it. Okay then, so that's the word of wisdom. So wisdom works uh, uh, on how to do, it shows you what God wants you to do, how he wants you to go about doing it, uh, how to resolve a situation. Sometimes solutions, of, uh, sometimes problems, you know, are really messy. And sometimes you try and you can't seem to fix it. You've got to ask God for a word of wisdom. God, what do you want me to do? And then be happy to trust that that's actually the right thing to do and leave it at that. Sometimes we can be in so much turmoil ourselves, we just want to get everything right so we feel better. And God will just say, no, I want you just to leave it be for the moment. I'll work on it myself, and then I'll show you when you need to step up and do something. And so I found some situations I haven't known what to do and haven't been able to do it, and actually attempts to do it have made it worse. 
I've sometimes just left it to the Lord and said, God, show me what to do and when to do it. Then he'll suddenly just now, move now, act now, speak now. This is the time to say something. And when that happens, don't miss it. Don't miss that moment. That's the important moment. So how to pray for a person. Someone tells you their problems. You think, oh my goodness, what do I do, Lord? I need wisdom what to do. Show me how to pray. Because what they ask for may not be what you really need to be praying about. That's the dilemma. People will come and if you ask, tell them what's your need or what is your problem, they'll fill you with so much stuff. They already have lost their way. And they're trying to get you to also lose your way by telling you all the problem. <laughs> what you really need is, I've learned now when people come for prayer, say, don't tell me all your problem. Just what is it you're believing God for? What do you need from God? And that forces people out of, I'm full of problems, to looking for solutions. And uh, so, for example, if, if you go to McDonald's and line up at McDonald's and they say, what do you want? You just stand there and say, oh, I don't know, you know, whatever you feel to give me. Yeah, it's sort of nonsense, isn't it, really? So, when, so oh, and you go, suppose you go to McDonald's and stand in line up there and they say, what do you want? And you begin to talk about how hungry you are and how long it is since you've had your last meal and you start to, you know, they're going to get bored with all that. So just tell me what you need, you know, and so... When you come to an altar call or someone's come up for prayer and you ask, what do you want? And they say, oh, well, whatever God wants for me. I say, well, he wants lots of things for you. But if you don't know them specifically, you probably won't get any of them. And people don't like that answer, but it's actually very true. Sounds very spiritual or whatever God wants. Actually, if we know what God wants for us, we can ask specifically and believe to receive it. If we have that kind of attitude, whatever he wants to give, it's passivity and full of unbelief. It'll produce nothing. You've got to realize that. So that's why Jesus, many times in the Gospels, asks people, what do you want? The blind man comes up. Now, hello, what's up with Jesus? You know, there's a blind man like this. And you, what do you want? Hello? <laughs> I know I can't see. <laughs> but but you, can you get the idea? But Jesus was wanting to verbalize what he was looking for. So many times, Jesus asked the person, what do you want? So he made them express their need or their faith. He made them give voice to what they're wanting from him. So when you're ministering to people, it's helpful if they tell you what they want, what they're believing God for or looking to God to do. And you may not have all the answers, but at least you're focused on the solution, not on all the problems. Having said that, there are some counseling issues that people need help to pull their problem apart and find out what it's rooted in and sort that out. And without knowing that, you can't deal with it. So, um, but it just helps if you can keep people in the faith mode. So the word of wisdom is, what do we do? In 2 Samuel 5, 22 to 25, David was, uh, the, was anointed king. And immediately he was anointed king. The Philistines rose up to go out to battle and they wanted to kill him. And so he, his immediate response was this. He put on his armor, put on his sword, got the army together, went out to fight. Then when he slowed down a bit, he said, Lord, do you want me to fight? <laughs> Should I go into this battle? And two questions. Lord, and notice the simple. And they both actually have a yes, no answer. Lord, should I fight this battle? Yes or no? God says yes. See, the second question, will I win the battle? Yes. So he said, then how do you want me to do it? And he showed him how to do it. That is a word of wisdom. What to do, when to do it. Next time he comes back, they come back again. He defeats them, routes them out, gets rid of their idols. They come back a little while later, back into a new battle. So now the tendency is to think like this. Oh, oh, the Philistines, I know how to deal with them. I've already won one victory. I'll do it this way. Leaning on your experience rather than leaning on the Holy Spirit. He was not like that. He went, God, what do you want me to do? God said, don't do it the same way. This is how you do it this way. You wait, go around behind the trees and ambush them from behind when I set it up for you. So that is a word of wisdom. What to do, when to do it, how to do it. So you'll find many situations in marriage, family, ministry, work. You don't know what to do. You need a word of wisdom. What to do, when to do it, and how to do it. Noah got a word of wisdom. God showed him to build an ark. God revealed what's about to come. Gave him a prophetic word. There's going to be rain. What's rain, Lord? There hadn't any rain. He said, okay, let me put it to you this way. There wouldn't be no ground to stand on. <laughs> the whole place going to be covered in water. He said, well, what do I do? Build an ark. So he showed him what to do, gave him the pattern and how to do it. That's wisdom. It's a wisdom from God. So uh, think about this. 
uh, Jesus uh, was out there with a group of uh, the, the religious leaders. They brought a woman caught in adultery. She's caught in the very act. Now, she's caught in the act. Where's the man? If they caught them in the act, I mean, they caught in the act. There's got to be two of them. Where's the guy? So there's a hypocrisy here where they're judging the woman and they're trying to set Jesus up. So they bring the woman to Jesus and say, Jesus, Moses' law said she's been caught in adultery. We caught her in the act. There's no doubt about the crime. Moses' law said she shall be stoned to death. What do you say? Now, it was a setup from the beginning because if he said, or Moses' law said stoned to death, stoned her to death, then they say, whoa, what kind of loving preacher is this? Man, he's hard. Well, we don't even do that. You know, we let him off from time to time too. So they, they do that. If he said, oh, let them off, they say, oh, well, he's against Moses' law. Moses' law, very clear is what needs to happen. And Jesus is against the law. He's eroding the law. Uh, we, we need to put him, or put him away and kill him. Do you see the trap? Religious spirits will always try to set up this or that, right or wrong, yes or no. God has got a hundred ways through it. And so when you're trapped in a right and wrong, yes or no, Jesus never, never went either way. He found a different way through it, word of wisdom. So Jesus, in this case, didn't even answer them. He just carried on writing in the sand. While he's writing in the sand, he's thinking, Father, what do you want me to say? What do I say? Word of wisdom drops in. He said, okay, guys, yep, you're right. That's what the law says. Whoever's got no sin, cast the first stone. He's carried on writing. Now, he stunned them. Because now they're trapped. Sure, that's what the law says, stoner. Okay, if you've got no sin, you go and throw the stone. Really? No sin? <laughs> they walk away. Their own conscience convicted them. They knew what they were up to. And, they, and there's no way, if they came out and did that, someone would expose it. There's no way they're going to go. So they set up the trap and he snapped them. And then he turned to the woman and said, where are you accusers? I don't see anyone. No, they right. say, I don't accuse you either. Go your way. Don't sin anymore. So he didn't minimize the issue of sin. It's just he didn't judge her. Son of man's not come to judge, come to save. So he, doesn't, he didn't judge her. He just said, this is destructive in your life. Don't do this. You, know, you need to change your lifestyle. Change what you do. Don't sin anymore. So that's a word of wisdom. So there are many situations we need a word of wisdom. And uh, so get me, get, I'll get me get a few practical things just on the word of wisdom. First one is, don't be impulsive in making decisions. Don't be impulsive in making decisions. Impulsiveness inevitably ends up with a disaster or some kind of problem. Second thing is, don't act under pressure of people or circumstances. Don't react because people are pressuring you or circumstances are pressuring you. Saul did that in 1 Samuel 13, cost him his whole leadership because he so blew it by responding to pressure. So ask the Lord for wisdom. Lord, what should I do? Or we talk to you about experiencing things of the kingdom, how you need to have the attitude of a child. Father, what do I do? I don't know what to do. Help me to know what to do. Give me an insight how I should respond and what should I do and when should I do it. And so we just have a simple thing. And you may just suddenly see a picture of what you need to do. It can drop in like a picture, drop in as a thought, drop in as an idea, and you suddenly you don't know how you know, you just know exactly what you need to do. And when you know what to do, peace comes. The problem hasn't solved, but you are at peace because now you have wisdom, you know what to do. So word of wisdom is an important gift to seek after because in every situation where you're ministering or have needs or whatever, it gives you direction from the Holy Spirit what to do. It comes as a picture, impression, thought, inspired idea, and you might just be reading and suddenly something leaps up and you've got it, a word of wisdom from God, just exactly what to do. You might even be listening to someone speak and they're speaking on one thing and in the middle of it you just hear, I know exactly what to do. You might even be having a shower in the middle of the shower, whoop, I know exactly what to do. You might just be lying down resting as you're going to sleep. Uh, more often it happens when you wake up, you go to bed asking the Lord what to do, wake up, oh, I know what to do because your spirit stayed working through the night. So that's all it is. It's just what to do, when to do it, how to do it. And it comes as a picture and impression, and it makes a huge difference. The biggest issue is we tend to react to circumstances and people rather than waiting and leaning on God for wisdom what to do. Here's a simple, typical example. Jesus uh, had, his, had a very close friend called Lazarus, John chapter 11, and Lazarus was sick, and they said, your friend is dying. He did nothing. He said, excuse me, Jesus, your friend is dying. Did you hear the word dying? And nothing. 
And then a third time, you know, Jesus, he is nearly dead. So this pressure, in other words, the implication is you're his friend, some kind of friend you are, you could heal him and you won't. So you see the pressure that brings? But Jesus refused to respond. And then he got a freedom. He saw what the Father was doing. This is not going to end with death. It's going to end with glory. There's a resurrection coming. So when he got there, already the family were offended because they expected him to come straight away. This is their friend Jesus, and he didn't help. What is that about? But he had a word of wisdom, and he was able to bring a much greater miracle into that situation, a resurrection. So, so pressures of people and circumstances can lean you into having to operate in the flesh rather than just lean into God and say, I can wait until God speaks to me what to do. It's so important to really desire. Of all things, seek wisdom. Wisdom, knowing the right thing to do at the right time. This is one of the biggest and best gifts to have. Solomon, when he was given an opportunity for everything, riches and whatever, he said, I have one thing. Give me a heart that hears and wisdom to know what to do. And God said, boy, you asked. Boy, yeah, that was a great request. I'll give you that. And I'm going to give you everything else that you didn't ask for as well. Because if you have a hearing heart and wisdom, you can handle all the other things. Okay, then, so we'll take a break now. Let's have a break for uh, about uh, half an hour. And uh, then after that, we'll come in and we'll look at faith, miracles, and healing. That'll be great. <laughs>